Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for letting me come and share a few moments with you today. Uh, I told uh, Dr. Riley not to talk very much about my bio because those things get kind of boring. Let me, let me give you it in a nutshell, okay? I'm a farm boy from Illinois. I, in fact, joined the Navy because I got drafted by the Army. Uh, I, uh, in fact, uh, walked into this marvelous adventure working with magnificent young men and women from all across our country and beyond. Uh, loved flying airplanes, loved driving ships, and I'll tell you what, when you love something, it's not work. It's just, it's fun. And uh, my family and I uh, ended up and got all the way around the world a bunch of times. And when you turn around a bunch of times like that, next thing you know, you've been doing something for over 30 years. And uh, we end up and then found ourselves here at the University of Central Florida. So it's, it's, we've had a wonderful life and a wonderful opportunity. And I appreciate the opportunity to come and share some thoughts with you today about leadership and integrity and some things that are real important no matter what you do. In fact, I would share with you that the things that I want to discuss with you today are important for everyone no matter where you end up in life. You don't need to be some big hotshot. I'm talking about whether you are the secretary treasurer of your local child's PTA organization, whether you are a member of a church group, uh, whether you are the head of NASA, and uh, Colonel Cabana is a dear, dear friend of mine. He and his wife, Nancy, have, we've been good friends for, geez, I don't know, a long, long time. But these principles are important because they're all about how you live your life, how you interact, how you motivate people to do things, and how you end up and lead what I call a life of consequence. How important at the end of the time when you have to finally take a knee on this planet, wouldn't it be nice to look back and say what I did mattered? And I'll tell you what, it doesn't matter the size of your office or the size of the organization. It matters how you conducted your life, how you impacted people, how you leveraged everyone's ability to contribute to some common good. And I want to talk to you about that a little bit today. Uh, first of all, uh, leadership. Anybody want to give me a definition of leadership? Anybody have one? This is an interactive course, by the way. You can't just sleep, okay? All right. Somebody, give me, an, give me a, a definition of what leadership is. A vision caster. A vision caster. Very good. Any other ideas? Yes? Ability to get things done through other people. Get the things done through other people. A great concept in there. I'll talk a little bit more in a second. Yes? Setting an example. Setting an example. Yes? Motivating others, you bet. Yes, sir. Who has dreams and the ambition to follow them. Very, very good. How about all of those together, something along the lines about the capacity and the will to rally men and women to a common purpose? And then there has to be another very important element. You can have somebody who can rally to a common purpose, and you're not a leader, you're a disaster. The second piece, which is important, though, is the character to inspire confidence in that common purpose, confidence in you as the leader, and confidence in your people that they're doing the right thing and it is worth their effort to contribute to that common cause. So it has a couple of pieces. It has this capacity and will. You're right, it's hard to be a leader. It's fun, it's a privilege. But you have to have that capacity, you gotta have the will, but you also have to have the character. And I'm going to focus more on the character piece today than I am the other pieces. Let's talk about you. Is everybody here an engineer or a budding engineer or do they know an engineer or something like that? Okay, some of you date an engineer maybe? I don't know. Uh, what a magnificent career field to be in, and I mean that. And you're talking to a guy who was a biology major, but I saw the light uh, throughout my career and had the privilege of ultimately going to the Navy's test pilot school, which is pretty engineering intensive. I also had the privilege later in life to go to the Navy's nuclear power school, which is fairly engineering intensive. Engineering, no matter what field of engineering, and the principles that you learn in engineering are invaluable to life, if you ask me. It allows you to innovate. It allows you to have a discipline in how you do business. It allows you to objectively look at alternatives and hopefully be smart enough then to select the best alternative. All sorts of principles that you are learning in your engineering studies will serve you well no matter what you do in the next phase of your life. So thank you for being in an engineering field. Thank you for adhering to the 
difficult work of having discipline, having focus, having teamwork, having standards, having the ability to listen to multiple options, and then the courage to make a best solution. Those principles of engineering, I think, are great ways to, in fact, lead your life and get things done back there in the back, whoever gave me that uh, uh, definition of, of leadership. Absolutely. How many of you were born leaders? Come on, be, be courageous here. You were born a leader? Yeah, okay. <laughs> She's wrong. No, no, no. A message that's very, very important. You're talking to a farm boy from Illinois. I didn't know a navy from a shoebox in my early life, and yet I will tell you that leaders are developed. If you want to be a leader, you can be a leader, okay? Leaders are not born. Leaders are developed through hard work, through experience, through the courage to try, fall down, get up, and try again. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about some characteristics, but it's important to know, because I hear some people say, you know, I'm really not a leader. I, I can't lead here. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just. They always think the leader is either the cool guy or the beautiful girl who's got this incredible charisma and life is easy and, and we're all jealous of them, right? A little bit. They are no more leaders than the man in the moon is a leader, because that's not what leadership is about. Leadership is about other important characteristics. If you do have charisma, if you have that natural capacity where people kind of want to follow you, you may not have to work quite as hard on day one in a leadership role because you've got that natural magnetism. But let me tell you what, that lasts about a day. It doesn't really matter in a leadership position or in a leadership role. Other things are far, far, far more important. The other thing that I want you to remember, if nothing else about leadership today, don't over-engineer your foray into a leadership responsibility, okay? Don't over-engineer it. Leadership is principally underpinned by decency, common sense, a little bit of respect for others, and a couple other things I want to share with you here in just a second. Some people make it harder than it is. Oh my gosh, we've got to figure out every angle of leadership. Leadership is about involvement, it's about commitment, it's about being willing to learn on the job. It's never about having it perfectly figured out on opening day. Planning is important, always. And why is planning important? Pardon me? No, don't tell me. Yeah, yeah. Bad planning leads to poor performance. You're right. Uh, there's a, a little acronym there that I remember <laughs> once in my life. So planning is important because it's part of that engineering principles we talked about. It's the discipline think through of what the problem is and what the potential solutions might be. But never think that the plan is the answer. It's the planning that is the answer. The plan is merely a point of departure. It is a disciplined, thought out point of departure, and that's far better off than just freewheeling in the wind out there and departing from that point. So, uh, but don't over engineer this thing called leadership. You don't have to. In fact, I am a profound believer in Murphy's, Murphy's basic laws of leadership. Anybody know those? I don't remember them either, but I got them on this piece of paper right here. And I live them, and I believe, again, it works no matter what sort of leadership position you're in. The basics are essential. And here's what Murphy said about leadership. <coughs> Number one, the most important things are always simple. The most important things are always simple. Number two. The simple things are always hard. The simple things are always hard. Number three, I love this one. If it's stupid and it works, it's not so stupid. Think about that. How many times do we second guess something or say, hey, we've never done it that way before, that really sounds silly. If it's stupid and it works, I would suggest to you we may need to take a hard look at it because it works. Think about that. Here's an important one. Nobody ever watches your good work 
Nobody ever watches your good work until you make a mistake. Okay? What's the message there? The message there is you always do your best. You're always proud of what you do because nobody ever watches until you make a mistake. Another very important Murphy's Law here. A good leader must be a good listener first. A good leader must be a good listener first. A corollary to that is, think about this, no good leader approaches any problem with an open mouth. No good leader approaches any problem with an open mouth. And you know leaders like that, or at least you know humans who are in leadership positions who are like that, right? They come right in and know what the matter of the problem is. They're talking because they got the answer, right? I'll tell you right up front, they are not a good leader. Because seldom is the answer in the one person who, in fact, sits at the front of the bus. It is generally always in the group working together. At the end of the day, somebody has to make the decision. Somebody has to stand accountable for the decision. Somebody has to have the courage to do that. I, I, don't, I don't argue that. But never believe that someone who walks into a problem with an open mouth is going to always have the right solution. So good leaders start by being good listeners. Listen clearly to what the issue is. Listen to your teammates so you can help construct that very, very important solution. Last one is just kind of, I mean, this is true in, again, every field. Professionals are predictable, and regrettably, the world is filled with amateurs. So you better be on your toes if you're a leader because things change. I mean, that's just the way it is. If you're not comfortable dancing to the change, you're going to struggle as a leader because things change no matter how well you plan them. So, okay, you got all those? The important things in life are simple. The simple things are hard, okay? Something works, and yet it sounds, or someone else says it's stupid, and it works. Think about it real hard. It may be the exact solution that you need. Nobody ever watches until you make a mistake, so be careful how you do business. Good leaders must first be a good listener, and the world is filled with amateurs. You as a leader get to help manage some of that amateurish chaos and hopefully put it all together for good effect. So, okay, how about some characteristics of good leaders? Those, that's, that's Murphy's laws of leadership. I believe it. I've followed those laws or tried to anyway my entire career in a whole bunch of situations. And they have never failed me. Some characteristics of good leaders. Yes? Persistence. Persistence, absolutely. Integrity, Integrity you bet. Respect, you bet. He stole yours? Yeah. Give me another one. I, uh, trustworthiness. trustworthiness, you bet. Yes, sir. Patience. Patience, you bet. Creativity. Creativity? Yes. Charisma. Charisma? Honesty. Honesty. Boldness. Boldness. I like them all. Yes. Initiative. Initiative. Empathy. Empathy. Empathy, yes. Confidence. Competence, yes. Perfect. Yes. I saw this on a TED video, but um, getting people to believe why you're doing something rather than just what you're doing. You bet. You bet. No, I, I, I totally. As a good leader, you owe it to your people to answer why. If you don't understand why, why would I have any trust and confidence that we're going down this road? I mean, so you got to think about that. And you don't have to sit and explain every single reason of every single thing. I mean, I, I'm thinking now of my grandchildren. Well, why, Grandpa? Well, why? Well, why? Well, why? You know, why is the sun red? I don't know. Why? Well, I mean, y y you can play that game until you drop, and you know, I'm not suggesting you do that. But yes, you ought to be able to explain why. You ought to have the courage to discuss the whys. And sometimes it's not a popular answer, but it is the right answer. So, absolutely. I, in fact, remember myself, and you have captured all of them, I put it under the C category, five C's. And you have said a couple of them, and you, all of your terms fit under these categories. First one is competence. If you're, in fact, in the operating room conducting neurosurgery, and you happen to be a biologist or a plumber, you're going to struggle as a leader, okay? All right. Competence is important. It's not crucial. 
What is crucial if you are not the expert, that you are brave enough and smart enough to realize who the experts are and listen to them. You can still, in fact, shape the course of action. You can be the motivator, all those sorts of things. But don't, in fact, think that you can sit on the sidelines and continue to lead if you have no competence in the area. Your responsibility, again, is to listen, trust, and you better get the learning curve moving fast. You owe that to your people. You owe that to the common purpose. But competence is truly, truly very important. <coughs> What's another one, I think? And it trumps competence any day of the week. It's maybe the most important C. That's character. We're going to talk an awful lot about that. I've told the dean, I've told uh, uh, Dr. Riley, I've told uh, uh, Mr. Rich, I've told, and I've said this in a thousand speeches. You give me two people, one who's got competence and one who's got character, it'll be a short race who I pick first every time. Every time. It'll be the person with character. I firmly believe you can teach most human beings to do anything. Someone you cannot trust, someone who does not respect the group, respect what they are doing, it gets real hard sometimes to work with them. In my most formative stages of my adult life when I was in the military, the only thing at the end of the day that matters is character and trust. I'll tell you what, when you are in fact waist deep in seawater in some dark passageway and it's filled with smoke and there's sounds going on and off like you just can't believe, you don't give a hoot except that when you reach out and touch someone, that you know that they have the character to do the right thing. Competence is important. It's incredibly important, but it is not as important as character. If you want to be a good, good leader, if you want to be an effective leader, you'd better have character. And we'll talk some more about that in a second. Another one, somebody said it back here, I think, empathy. I use the word compassion. Not everybody is as smart as you, not everybody is as good looking as you, not everybody is as motivated as you, nobody is as wealthy as you. You will always find people around you who aren't quite as good as you, and if you expect them to be as good as you or they're worthless, guess what? You, you've missed the bubble. You're the one, I think, that's, that's approaching worthless. You gotta be compassionate about your people. You gotta understand that every person brings some strength to the table, and your job as a leader is to leverage their strengths, leverage their strengths, and compensate for their weaknesses. All of us have flaws, all of us have weaknesses, and it doesn't mean that we're ineffective. It means you better understand that, you better have the intellectual honesty to understand that and address it. And one of the ways you address that is to be compassionate enough to understand who your teammates are, what their strengths are, and you ought to be working to leverage their strengths and not over-focusing on their weaknesses, okay? You gotta compensate for weaknesses, and I'm not saying you have to ignore them, you can't do that. You gotta understand, though. And that's called being compassionate about your people. You can't not not care about your people and be a good leader. You must care about your people. In fact, you must care more about them than yourself. Because at the end of the day, it's the team that gets the job done. Rarely is it the individual. So, compassion is crucially important. Another C, and I heard several of you say it uh, in different ways, courage. You better have courage. And I'll share a couple more thoughts about that with you in a second. Being a leader's hard. It is often unpopular. Heard a phrase one time, and it went something like this, no progress is ever made without first one being in an unpopular position. Think about that. We, we, we kind of love status quo in our lives, right? I mean, we truly do. Change is difficult. You got to have courage to make the tough call because there are times when it's going to be unpopular. It's going to be times when it's going to be downright hurtful to some. You got to be compassionate enough to work through that, but you got to have the courage to sustain the standards. Courage is important. And let me tell you what, physical courage is easy. Most of us have physical courage because if you get scared enough, you'll do the right thing, okay? I'm not talking about this type of courage. I'm talking about the courage to do the right thing no matter the personal consequences. To do the right thing no matter the personal consequences. 
That's the courage that I'm talking about, and I will talk about that a little bit more, too. It's, it's the moral courage. I'm not so much concerned about the physical courage. I'm talking about the moral courage to do the right thing, but you do have to have courage. Commitment is a given. If you aren't committed as a leader, how do you possibly think you're going to inspire your team to get to work and get something done? I mean, give me a break. Do I need to explain that any further? And you don't commit by doing this. I mean, you talk about cheap talk. Talk is cheap. How do you show commitment? You get involved. You, in fact, roll up your sleeves and you work as hard or harder than anybody else on the team. You lead by personal example. You truly do. Commitment equals involvement in my book. It really does. The last C is for the word change. Anybody can, quote, lead when times are good and we're in status quo and, and, and nothing's difficult. Anybody. A scarecrow can lead then. It doesn't matter. Leadership gets tough when you're in a stinky situation or you must change. Change is hard for everyone. It truly is. But the world is about change. And we don't change just for change's sakes. We change to improve and or adapt. And you better be comfortable with change if you want to be an effective leader. Things just don't stay the same. If they stay the same, what do I need a leader for? Think about it. I can reduce that employee on the bankroll. I don't need it. If you're going to be a leader, you better be comfortable with change. And we don't change just to, in fact, change. We change because we think it through. You have all those skills, that discipline, that innovation, the thoughtfulness, the assessment, all those sorts of things to come up with what we ought to do because it makes good sense and it's the right thing to do. Got those five C's? Whether five or six, I don't know. There's a bunch of them. Okay, uh, six. You got a bonus today. You got that sixth one, okay? Competence, character, compassion, commitment, change, and courage was thrown in there someplace. That's an easy way that I, that I remembered and I, and I would suggest that those would serve you well um, in, in a leadership position if you want to be a leader. Is a leadership position and a leader the same thing? No. Absolutely not. The world is filled with humanoids who in fact sit in leadership positions and are no more leaders than the man in the moon. They truly aren't. I know that you know some. You know one, don't you? You don't have to say his or her name, but I know you know one. The fact that you end up in this little position, you get the nice little desk title here that says ba ba da ba doo, uh, you're no more a leader until you go out and start impacting people in some positive way. A leader is not simply someone who sits in a leadership position. And that kind of gets boogered up in the world sometimes. It really does because people end up in leadership positions and at the end of the day they aren't really terribly effective leaders. So I'm hopeful that all of you will be effective leaders. Two other pieces of leadership that I have touched on but I want to say them again because I think that they are the crux of being a good leader. First one's this notion of moral responsibility. And that means that you have the courage to do the right thing. I said this once before, the right thing to do no matter the personal consequences. We got an awful lot of people who do not have moral responsibility because they in fact waver. They themselves don't maintain the own, their own standards that they've set for the group or for the team, okay? You see that. What do you think of the person who supposedly is a leader and says these are the rule sets and this is what we're going to do and these are the standards and yet they're taking shortcuts or they're in fact shortchanging those. You, you don't respect them, do you? Leadership is about respect. It's about setting the right example. And let me tell you what, I'm uninterested, well I shouldn't say I'm uninterested because we all should be interested in the law. I'm very interested in legal responsibility, that's pretty easy, but let me tell you what, that's the bare minimum opening bid. Legal. And, and I'm not talking about legal responsibility, it's easy. Somebody wrote it down on a piece of paper, you read down the rule book, you're either, you're either right or you're wrong, I mean, that, that's pretty uninspiring to me. Uh, I, I mean, I, I respect the fact, but it's not inspiring to me that somebody fulfills their legal responsibility. Well, I'd hope so. You know, probably don't want to go to jail. I'm impressed by leaders who in fact have some moral courage and take the moral responsibility of their leadership position. Leadership, by the way, is not a valueless proposition. Hear what I have said. Leadership is not a valueless 
proposition. You must have values. And you, the leader, are expected to uphold and live to those values. And that's what moral responsibility is. And at the end of the day, I'll make it simple for you. You either have moral courage or what? You're right. You're a moral coward. I can't say it much, much, much more kindly than that. You either have moral courage or you are a moral coward. And if you are a moral coward, you, by definition, cannot be a good leader. Leadership is tough, I promise you. It is hard, but that's what is expected of you as a leader. That's what the people expect of you. That's what you should expect of yourself. And in that moral responsibility, don't tell me you can separate out your professional and your personal life. You can't. Think about leaders that you, in fact, have heard about or read about in your lifetime who, in fact, some people say, well, he or she did a great job on the job. But oh, by the way, after hours or whatever, they didn't do such a great job. How do you feel about that person? I'm not asking you how you feel about the end result of their professional work. I'm saying, how do you feel about that person? Not as trustworthy. Not as trustworthy, yeah. I, I feel kind of sick at my stomach sometimes that people demean themselves, demean their team, and diminish their contributions because they didn't have the moral courage to, in fact, do the right thing 24-7, on the job, off the job. I'll tell you what, you can be at Kmart buying underwear, and if you do something that is not morally responsible, and I can't imagine what that would be right now, buying underwear in Kmart, but, but <laughs> what I'm saying is you can do something so stupid out there that seems so insignificant to you that you, you can corrupt your reputation and your effectiveness as a leader because guess what? Somebody's watching. You want to be a leader? There's a word you must, in fact, remove from your vocabulary, and that word is privacy. There is no privacy on this planet anymore. If you're in a leadership position, I promise you, somebody's looking. Remember that Murphy's Rule said something about nobody ever watches until you do something wrong. And it may be something minor wrong, but I promise you, they're watching, and it's going to come back. You can't pick up the paper without seeing that every single day. So remember that. It's a 24-7 proposition. It is not a valueless proposition. One last thing I want to say about leadership, and then I'm going to be quiet here and, and hopefully uh, have some questions if you might have some. How do you know if you're being an effective leader? Have people following you. That's the easy way. You're right. Have people following you. How about you're in a tough, tough situation where you've got to make a tough decision. How do you know that you're the leader? <laughs> How about the deafening silence around you? Isn't it incredible when things are going well and it's an easy situation, heck, everybody's got a great idea. Some of them are positive, some of them are criticisms. Let me tell you what, when you are neck deep in muck and you've got to make a tough, tough decision, you will be stunned at how silent it is. And that's because a lot of people don't have the courage to stand up and make hard decisions and make those value calls that must be made if you're going to make the right decision for the people. Um, so get used to silence too. I, uh, I, uh, I can't tell you how lonely it gets when you really have to make tough, tough decisions. But that's what's expected of you and you should expect that of yourself. I was born in uh, the land of Lincoln, and even though that state's got some silly things going on in it right now, I'm still very proud of it. And Lincoln is one of my, my heroes. I, I'm going to close on a quote that he has because I think that it sums up what you ought to do as a leader. And again, think of, try to remember some of the things I talked to you about. I mean, use some common sense, use decency, remember the basics, trust your people, empower your people, listen to your people. And he says it all here, and I'm going to read this so I don't screw up the words, but I just think it's, I think it's great. He said, and I quote, I do the best I know how, the very best I can, and I mean to keep on doing it to the end. You've probably heard that before, but sentence two is the one that I love. If the end brings me out all right, what is said against me will not amount to anything. If the end brings me out wrong, then ten angels swearing that I was right would make no difference. The bottom line is it's fun to be a leader. It's a privilege to be a leader. It really is. And I urge you to take advantage of any opportunity that you get to lead because that's how you get good. 
You lead, you're going to stumble. I promise you. Lord knows my knees have more bruises than you can imagine. But you get up and you try again and you learn. Leverage your people. Listen to your people. Do your darndest to be a good leader. And uh, I think that you'll enjoy that opportunity. So thank you for giving me an opportunity to share some of my thoughts about uh, leadership and what makes it hard, what makes it easy, and some things that maybe you would think about wherever you lead. And I mean whether you're leading as a parent, whether you're leading a, as, as a teacher, whether you're leading in a business, whether you're leading in a community group, it doesn't matter. I think those principles will serve you very, very well. And I, I promise you that the good leaders that I've been blessed to work with during my lifetime, one of them you talked to a couple of weeks ago, uh, Bob Cabana, um, all the good leaders that I know practice uh, these principles or something very darn close to it. So thank you very much. And uh, I'd be happy to talk about anything except White Sox baseball. I'll leave that to Bob Rich, OK? How do I handle conflict resolution? I'm probably kind of blunt in my approach. I, and what I mean by that, and, and that's a terrific question, because we've got a lot of that in the world today. We truly do. I don't believe that you can resolve conflicts without talking. So the very first thing I think that you must do as a leader is you must, if, if you have the right climate in your organization, your people will be willing to come and talk to you. Uh, if you don't have the right climate, now you're in trouble because there might not be the trust, there might not be the, 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 the comfort level that you can openly express a difference of opinion. Uh, I say your job as a leader is to make sure you have that environment so that then there becomes a conflict. We can sit down at the table and we can lay out what are the issues. You know, what's, what's annoying you? What's annoying me? Why are we doing what we're doing? What are good courses of action to either correct that or to work it better ahead? I, I don't think there's a lot of magic to it. I think it involves trust. I think it involves respect. It really involves respect. And I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm remindful of, a, uh, one of my, another one of my heroes, and this is starting to date you. Anybody ever heard of Johnny Wooden? Oh, boy, I am dating myself. So, Well, he was an old basketball coach uh, for some team out on the West Coast a few years ago. Uh, in, in my view, he may have been the best coach that ever coached in, in, in basketball. Uh, when he was with UCLA, won what? nine straight NCAA champions. And this is back in the day when you came in, you did not play as a freshman, you stayed till your senior year was over and it, things were different. But he talk about conflict resolution. He talks about, again, something that, that's parallel to that, but it's important. I'm going to share this story because it affects leadership. He said, I in fact started off playing in 1964 when they won his first national championship with a bunch of fast white guys, could shoot the lights out of the basket, they were fast as can be, and they were all white guys. He didn't have any black guys on the team. Well, let me tell you what, we win, went through the 60s and the 70s, and the next thing you know, we got, you know, remember the era of the big hair, big fun? Uh, I'm thinking, everybody, I mean, I, I look at one of my daughters-in-law, I mean, I saw a picture of her in college, she's got this hairdo that's, uh, she always says, big hair, big fun, but uh, anyway, uh, the, 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 the type of player that Johnny Wooden worked with changed over the 10 years that he was whipping off those uh, consecutive NCAA championships. He said, not once did I change my <laughs> standards. Not once. What did he change? Another great, great lesson here if you want to be a leader. He changed his approach. He realized you take the raw material that you get, and if you're a good leader or a good coach, you, in fact, change the methods in how you mold that talent to be successful. That is a perfect parallel to working as a leader in whatever you're doing. You take a look at the talent that you have. You heard me say earlier, you leverage strengths, you compensate weaknesses, you pick out the best package, you leverage their talents, you as a leader change the approach, perhaps, he never changed his standards once, and that's why they won 10 straight championships. But conflict resolution, he talked to his players. He didn't say, I mean, if you look at that first one, too, you can kind of laugh about this, too. You know, everybody used to have a crew cut, and they wear Converse white low tops. You know, I mean, uh, that, that was really cool back in those days. This is 100 years ago for you youngsters. But uh, fact of the matter is he, in fact, talked to his players and told them, these are what the standards are, but we can change how we approach. The process can change a little bit. The approach, 
that was a, I think it, it parallels with what you said, conflict resolution. We have differing opinions. Good Lord, you know, we all come from different backgrounds, different circumstances, and yet I will tell you, at the end of the day, I have found that most people want a good solution and are willing to work for it, and we just need to be sensitive to needs and feelings, and you can work out a good solution. Is that, is that one other very important point there? Most things that are worth doing in life, there's probably 26 ways you can do them successfully and decently. You have to find out what best fits for your organization and your circumstance. So care more about the substance and less about the label. We're a label society. I mean, we, we can't get past the label in half of our dealings and, and, and half of our biases. We need to get past the label and to the substance. And I think in conflict resolution, if you keep that forefront, in the discussions, you can get where you need to go. Does that, does that help? Okay, good. Other questions? When you were trying to be noticed, did you let your leadership do the talking for itself, or did you employ certain tactics um, so that your superiors would notice certain things? It's really simple. Work your butt off. Yeah, I did, I did nothing, and I tried to do nothing, and I, I hate, hate, that's a pretty harsh word. I shouldn't say that. I really, really, really dislike brown nosers. I, in fact, respect, and I think most people do, the person who unselfishly comes and does their darndest every single day, no matter what the task. And I would share that with you as you, in fact, walk across the stage and you head out to your first job, whatever it is. Oh, some of you will be worried about the marquee name on the office building that you go or what parking place you get. I wouldn't worry about any of that. I would work to become indispensable for your boss. And you do that by rolling up your sleeves, Keep your mouth shut usually, keep your ears open, learning, uh, and, and just work your tail off. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah, I, there are a few people who for a moment, a flashing moment, get a spotlight and they look like they're getting ahead. But I'll tell you what, if you in fact want to look just another day or a week or a month or year downstream, they will be a absolute wreck. Uh, Substance, not label. Label gets the spotlight sometimes. Substance gets the meaningful spotlight downstream after you've produced. Work to be indispensable to your boss, and, and uh, you'll be raging success, I promise. So, okay? Yes, sir. Um, what are you think some key skills that um, we may not get in the classroom that we should focus on developing, such as um, conflict resolution, um, public speaking skills? Like that. It's, a, it's a great, great question, Andrew. First of all, any chance you get to lead, I don't care how insignificant it is, I don't care if it is the most annoying committee that you could possibly assign to, if you get a chance to lead it, lead it. You will learn something. And I promise you, this is a game of learning. It's not a game of charisma, it's not a game of any of that, it's about learning. So any chance you get to lead. Any chance you get to speak, get it. How many people are pretty effective people that they get up in front of a group and they go and they can't communicate? At the end of the day, it's all about relationships and influencing people. And you influence people by being able to connect with them and talk with them and listen to them and work with them. So again, if you get a chance to speak, do it. You'll be nervous as can be at the first time. I mean, it, uh, you think those lights are fun. They aren't fun, but you just learn to ignore them. They don't matter. The last thing that I don't think we have a course in, and if you didn't learn it in Sunday school when you were growing up, you, you need to learn it. And, and, and we got a lot of people in the world today who are absolutely bankrupt of this value, and that's the value of humility. A good leader can't help but be humble because that means that he or she is focused on the group, on the cause, on the impact, and not worried about themselves. <laughs> I, I'm thinking, can anybody give me a recent example where we had a collection of people who are probably the most anti-descriptive of what I've just, uh, uh, in fact, uh, uh, described? Anybody watch TV Sunday night? I mean, you got to love the movie stars, okay? I mean, I, I love a couple of them, but um, um, talk about narcissistic, uh, I mean, self-loving human beings. Uh, that shouldn't be the first thing I notice about you if you're going to be an effective leader wherever you're, wherever you're serving. It's not about you. It's about the team. So humility is uh, in short supply in, in some places. If you become privileged enough to get a leadership position, be a humble leader 
It is not about your shining star. It is not about your success. It's about, did we get anything done that matters? At the end of the day, a leader has this most special privilege of all, and that's to help people lead a life of consequence. I think I mentioned that in my opening statement. Wouldn't it be nice when our time ends on this planet, we take a knee, that we could look back and say, hey, you know what? You know, it could have gone this way, it could have gone this way, it could have gone this way. But at the end of the day, I did lead a life of consequence. As a leader, you can help people lead a life of consequence by, again, doing something that matters, this substance piece, as opposed to worrying about the label. I get tired every time I turn on TV anymore. It's all about the labels. I mean, it's never about the substance. And uh, I think that's one of the reasons we don't have a lot of conflict resolution. I think it's one reason we kind of just go in this chaotic tailspin and, and, and don't get as much done as we ought to get. As, as I, I, think it's, I think it's too bad. Yes, sir? It happens all the time. If you think for a moment that you walk into an organization and you happen to be in the leadership position that you automatically are the leader of the group, it may not be true. You need to figure out where those talents are and how can you leverage them. It happens all the time. I can't tell you how many times just in my short few years here at the university, and oh, by the way, the university has a few silos. I call them silos of excellence just to kind of smooth the feathers, but we don't always have perfect teamwork in a university. I mean, I don't even figure that out yet, but is this on TV? I better, well, <laughs> <laughs> every big organization has those challenges. The secret, I think, is to figure out where those diverging viewpoints are or the diverging leadership, you know, and you got to go behind closed doors, you got to have a talk. And if you can try to engage and enlist that talent in a very, very special way. I'm working one, interestingly, right now, has nothing to do with Dean Salon, but it does have to do with the College of Engineering. And I think the answer is to enjoin and work together if you possibly can. And I'm not trying to make this all happy, glad, pretty, pretty, it never is ugly. There are some times where it does get ugly and you need to, in fact, take appropriate steps. Now, I'm not suggesting short knives or anything like that. I, uh, but, but there are times, as a leader, that's another one of those courage spots. There are sometimes there are cancers on the bus that need to leave the bus. Let me tell you what, if you have given all of the opportunities that you think are reasonable to let that person join the team, be productive, and they continue to be an outlier who can't be happy, and oh, by the way, there are a few of these in the world, you think, you as a leader have to have the courage to fix the problem. There are a lot of leaders who don't have that courage. It is incumbent on you because if it doesn't, your organization is not going to be as effective as it needs to be. Now, I don't believe in public executions. I don't think that's the way a good leader does it. You praise in public, you in fact correct in private, okay? Behind a closed door, if you need to fix the problem, you fix the problem. You may need to terminate that guy or that gal's position on the team. You may need to in fact fence them off so they don't impact the whole thing. There are times you have to do that. You're paid to do that as the leader. Because at the end of the day, what matters is did we have a productive outcome? I don't think you ought to do it willy-nilly. And shame on you if you don't do it without thinking it through and giving that person an opportunity to be productive. Does he or she have the tools to do what you have asked them to do? Can you sit down and explain to them why we're going this way and not this way? And remember, I said there were 26 ways to get to the end zone. There truly are. But the important thing is, is that the leader sometimes has some knowledge that another person who could be incredibly charismatic and, 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 and persuasive just doesn't know that. One of the things that I've had the advantage of, and anybody has, I guarantee you that uh, the, the dean has, as you move up the food chain in organizations through your career, all those things that you thought that were, how could they be so stupid? You know, I mean, uh, what you find out is there are always extra factors and extra facts that are impacting a decision. Give those people who, in fact, are above you in the food chain, give them the benefit of the doubt sometime. As a good leader, share as much as you can with the people working for you what those factors are, and you can sometimes capture that rogue bandit and, and get them back on the team. And again, if they've got great energy and great talent, your team will be all the stronger. But 
Yeah, it, it, it's, it's, not a, it's not a trivial issue. And there are sometimes people out there who just don't get it. And I say there's times that the cancer has to leave. It's, it's, just, it's not easy, but it's just simple. Yes, sir? You said if it's stupid and it works. Yes. It's not stupid. Um, could you share an example about that? In your no. My point being is, and I wasn't really trying to be silly there, there, how many times have you heard, we can't do it that way, we always do it this way, you know? Oh, come on, you've only been with us for a year and a half. I've been here 17 years, and uh, by golly, I know, I've been here, right? Have you ever heard that yet? Yeah, if you haven't, you will hear it, I promise you, in your career. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a disease that old people uh, start to get sometimes, you know? And, and for any of you here parents yet? Probably not, but let me tell you what, oh, you are, okay. Children will, in fact, remind you of that from time to time, too. My point being is the, the real message there was not, not really those literal words. The real message is the obvious answer is sometimes so simplistic you just can't believe that it's the obvious answer. And I'm, just, I'm asking you to open up your blinders when we're looking at possible alternatives. And even though somebody says, oh, it can't be done, oh, it can't do this, Oh, it can't do that. Or we've never done it that way before. What do you think about there, young whippersnapper? I mean, you'll hear crap like that. And excuse my technical term, that's where I classify it. It's crap. You need to be willing as a good leader, another buzzword, and I think it's important, challenge every assumption. And I'm not doing that to stall the process, but I mean, you've got to have that approach as a leader. You're willing to challenge anything because what you care about is the best process, the best end result. And you will stumble into something along there that somebody thinks is stupid, and by golly, it's not stupid because it works. Does that, does that help? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, okay. I, I, I can think of a couple of military examples, but I won't, I won't bore you with them, but it, it was exactly that. I mean, it was people who said, you can't possibly do that. So, you want me to give you an actual example? Well, I just yeah. thought you might have a humorous example. <laughs> None that I can share in mixed company. No, I'm just kidding. So, <laughs> no. I, 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 I'll talk to you offline if you want to. I mean, I can think of a couple, but, but really, what I'm, the, my message is be open to every alternative. Don't fall in love with your ideas. Not that you don't have some good ideas, but let, consider the notion that somebody else might have good ideas too. So, that, that's really what I'm trying to get to. So. And your leader has standards, and they're not following these standards that they're enforcing you or expect of you, um, how do you respectfully like deal with that? Um, Is this guy bigger than you or littler than you? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a, that's, a, that's a great question. In your journey in leadership, whether you are the follower or the leader, and, and, and realize everybody who's a leader has been a follower at once. I, I promise you, you aren't born as a leader and you don't always get to lead. And part of being a good leader is to understand what a good follower is and what it means to be a good follower. I hope you don't run into that, but you will. And there are times that you, in fact, have to grow calluses on your tongue. What have I just said? There are times there is no good answer. You don't ever vary your standards and your performance because the leader fails. Too many people do that. It's a cop-out. Well, he cheated on his travel claim. I can cheat on mine. Or he cheated on his wife, I can cheat on mine. I mean, are we in the world of excuses today for everything? And what's the classic one in Hollywood? Well, gee whiz, I gotta go to rehab, you know? I mean, we never take responsibility for our behavior. You have to do it. Don't get me wrong, not all your leaders are gonna be perfect. They are gonna have flaws. You need to have some flexibility and accommodation to realize what's most important. And there are other times where you gotta, in fact, draw the line. In, in the Navy, my basic rule, and it doesn't apply to everything, was like this. Realizing that there are multiple ways to get things done, and I, in fact, had this. If it's illegal, I don't cross that line. If it's immoral, I don't cross that line. And if it's unsafe, if I'm gonna break something or kill somebody, I don't cross that line. I mean, and, and, and what I'm saying is when you look at the range of operations that we ask our young servicemen and women to do, it, there isn't an answer. I mean, there are standard operating procedures, there are manuals that tell you how to do things, but I guarantee you all of those go out the window when the first shot is fired. And then when you're making decisions how to do things, and your leader in fact starts to make decisions, my personal standard was always those three. Is it legal? 
if it's legal, and I think it's the dumbest thing on earth, and I don't think anybody's going to get killed, and I don't think it's immoral, hey, that's the leader. I I'll follow that. There are usually opportunities, again, if you're fortunate enough to work in an environment that has a good uh, leadership climate, a good command climate, a good organizational climate, you can offline. You don't, up, you don't stand up in the audience right here and say, uh, hey, uh, Dean, that's the dumbest thing I've ever heard. You know, I, I wouldn't do that. Uh, first of all, it's disrespectful, it doesn't get anywhere. But I'll tell you what, I know Dean Saman, if you wanted to go into his office and close the door and say, hey, Dean, I don't really understand this, I think this is wrong, or blah, 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 blah. I just happen to believe, and I'm talking for my dear friend right now, uh, but I believe he would, he would listen to that. And that's an appropriate way to do it. So you have avenues to do it. Every organization I ever walked in had a, worked in had a suggestion box. Do you know? You, in fact, had a little box there. Uh, probably we do it electronically now. When I was growing up, we had pencils and paper. You, you know what those are. And you, you, could, you could anonymously write a suggestion, you know, but a, a suggestion could also be, I think this is wrong, or, you know, w whatever it is. Uh, I think there's a right way to do it. Again, I go back to a couple other things I said. Realize that everybody is different. Not everybody has your same values. That doesn't mean those values are wrong. They may not have the same level of a value that you have, uh, but I think there are ways to work with it. And there are times that I'll flat tell you, it's downright awkward, it's uncomfortable. You may need to make the decision that I can't operate here, I can't work here. Uh, I mean, I think that you get to a point where that's the case. I, I really do, and I'm not suggesting that's the first answer ever. And then there are other times, and believe it or not, I have them here, even working at the university, where I have to build my calluses up on my tongue because you just got to bite it sometimes. Let me ask Dean Simon, you ever had to bite your tongue here? Of course, I know that. How about you, Dr. Riley? All the time. Yeah, yeah, so. <laughs> You just got to do that. Does that help answer? Yeah. That's a hard, hard question. Uh, again, it's about human relations. I think in all of those circumstances, there's a right way. That's the respectful, the professional way to approach it. And there's a wrong way. But there are lines in the sand for each and every one of us that you can't cross. And I would suggest that you not cross those. Your values and your standards mean the most to you. And you have to determine what you can and cannot live with. So, OK, that helped? Okay. Anything else? Yes, sir. How do you feel about being friends with, um, like, your... I'm going I'm to go with a family example. And you can take your own family, and, and you can say, Al Harms, you are all wet. This is a personal opinion, but this is how I approach that. My job as a parent and my job as a leader is not to make friends. As a parent, I always thought that Gina and I's responsibility were to, in fact, help shape functional adults. At some point, wouldn't it be nice if the kids became functional adults? And that doesn't, wouldn't it be nice also if they became functional adults and we were still friends and friendly? And that's what you really try to work for. I would tell you it's the same thing as a leader. Your job is not to be the most popular leader on the planet. Your job is not to have everybody just admire you and love you. Your job is to get the job done. You do it fairly, you do it professionally, you do it using your team uh, to, to best advantage, all the things that I talked about previously. And at the end of the day, you hope that there is a friendly demeanor and a friendly atmosphere. Uh, but, but your job is not to be popular and your job is not to be friends. At the end of the day, I think, and, 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 and you never know, um, I think that good leaders at the end of the day genuinely are admired and respected. And most of the good leaders, the vast majority that I have ever dealt with, served with, worked under, worked for, um, I felt that there was a friendly engagement. It's hard to build some of the loyalty that you want, uh, and, and that's the mark of a good leader. Does the organization need you anymore? When you, in fact, have effectively led, you don't need the leader anymore. I mean, you, you do, but you don't. You, you, you've empowered your people. You've trained your people. You, you've given them the confidence that they can go out and get the job done with you. Uh, and then you've got to make sure you get out of the way as they go do good things. But at the end of the day, you'd like to think that there is a, uh, a warm relationship. And th does, that, does that help answer? Yeah, yeah. If you go around trying to please everybody and, in fact, make everybody your friend, Al Harms' opinion is you will fail as a leader. It, 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 your job and why we hired you as a leader is to get something done, and uh, that, that's what you have to go after. So, Did I see another hand over here? we got one more hand. Over. Okay, yes, sir. Um, what if you have to do something that's, let's say, unpopular 
with your team. Nobody mm -hmm. wants to do it. Again, another good reason to day one as a leader to start to build this climate where your people trust you. I promise you that when you're on an extended overseas deployment and you, in fact, for months have been figuring out that you're going to get home on a certain day and the day that you as the captain of the ship get to come up on and tell your, your crew of 6,000 men and women, oh, I'm sorry about that. We, in fact, have been extended for two months. How do you do that? You do it honestly, you do it with compassion, but you do it and it's pretty easy because there's a trust there. I think that they would trust you that you're not doing that just because you want to go steam in circles for another two months. There obviously is a reason, but, but no matter what your leadership role is, if in fact you have that horribly difficult situation, I mean, here's a tough one. How about when you have to lay off people? Again, if in fact you are honest and fair and you treat with respect and you lay out the facts and tell them why, my sense is it'll, it'll, go, it'll go down. It doesn't mean everybody's going to be giddy happy, but we will be able to continue to function and we will work through those. If there is distrust, now you can see what the problem is. Because even though I now explain to you why we are doing what we're doing, why would you believe me? You know? It, so. That, that piece called trust and working with your people and communicating with your people, the more they can know, uh, the better off they'll be. And that's probably one, something I didn't talk about. Uh, you can be this kind of leader, you know. I got all the secrets right here. So, oops, that's Bob Rich's microphone. Sorry about that, Bob. So, um, um, <laughs> you, you can be that kind of leader. Everything is close hold. I, I, I don't think that that's right. I have another. My, in fact, my people laugh at me because I, 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 I promote this. I don't believe in secrets, and I believe in sharing and empowering as much as I possibly can. Don't micromanage your people. Turn them loose. Your job as a leader, write this one down, is to carry water for the workers. Your job as a leader is to carry water for the workers. They are the ones who are going to get the mission accomplished. It's not your good looks and your brilliant uh, mind and your hard work. That's all important and it will play in it. But at the end of the day, an effective leader carries water for his or her workers. Do everything in your power to help them flourish. Help them flourish as an individual. Help them flourish in accomplishing the mission. Okay? Those are important pieces as a leader. But the, that only works if you have that trust and responsibility. But if you're that type of leader, where you care for your people and, you're, and it's all about your people and not about you, those tough times that you have to say those messages, they go down a lot better. And remember what Lincoln said, you do your best. At the end of the day, you do your best. So thank you again. <laughs>